times of the day. Think of the amount of news during the NBA's free agency and draft windows, and then double that, and then you have the craziness of football's transfer season. The transfer market is so the transfer market is so important because it helps teams get better and allows teams that need money to sell off their players to the, those teams hoping to get better. Transfer windows can help good teams add another piece to a championship caliber roster, or it can help mediocre teams start to build their championship caliber rosters. Whatever your team decides to do, there's no denying that the transfer market is big money and hugely important to football's financial success and its level of competition. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the different methods of transfers and player acquisition, as well as contract negotiations during the transfer window and the different clauses present in these transfer contracts so that when the transfer windows come around in January and July, you can start to sound smart with your football friends. Well, you may be asking, what is a transfer? A transfer is the sale of any player from one team to another across the football world. Any team can sell any player to another team if they agree on the price and the contract with the player being transferred as well as the transfer fee. We're gonna go into each of those terms a little bit later. Teams try to make transfers because they either wanna strengthen their clubs before the season begins, or they wanna beef up their club's roster during the middle of the season. Some pieces are merely complementary to the current roster, such as a strong bench player, while other teams can choose to try to transfer for a star player to plug right into their starting lineup. Transfers are not trades like in North American professional sports. The main thing that goes from the buying team to the selling team in the transfer window is money. Sometimes players can be included as a sort of sweetener to entice the other team to allow a transfer to take place, but transfers are almost exclusively centered around money. Another way to conceptualize it or to relate it back to North American professional sports is if in exchange for a player, one team decided to give the other cash considerations. Transfers are only made during two different windows. The transfer window opens for many professional uh, football leagues in early January and closes at the end of January or in early February. That's known as the winter transfer window. After that period, no transfers are allowed until the summer transfer window. Now the summer transfer window is a little bit more disjointed than the winter transfer window because some leagues like the English Premier League have their summer window open from the middle of May to early August. Other leagues, like the German Bundesliga, have theirs open from July 1 to September 2. During these windows, clubs are free to make as many transfers as they want, with virtually no limit on the amount of players being bought or sold to other teams. Some people have criticized this type of transfer method, including former Arsenal coach Arsene Wenger, who thought that transfers should be limited to just two transfers per window. This would allow just four transfers per year. That's barely any if you think about it. Virtually every North American sports team makes more than four trades per year. Wenger cited the rapid sell-off of football players from Newcastle United, who had dumped several players during the transfer window that would face Wenger again just a few weeks later on their new teams. I think Wenger is wrong to ask for a limit on transfers during the window, but he is right in that the window may be a little bit too short. If um, professional clubs were to extend the window and make it look more like a traditional trade deadline in North American professional sports, it may reduce the flurry of transactions done in such a short period of time or even just on the final day of the transfer window being open. Traditional transfers also require the buying team to pay a fee to the selling team. It's sort of like a, I'm paying you to let me take this player off your hands kind of thing. Transfer fees vary based on several different factors including a player's age, their skill set, contract terms, marketability, and the player's own demands. Some players may have an incredibly expensive transfer fee because they're young, talented, or integral to the selling team's success. So what are the different types of transfers that teams can make with their players? There are two different types of transfers. You have what is called the regular transfer, in which teams sell players from team to team without any sort of specification, and Bosman transfers. Bosman transfers are for players who have just a few months remaining on their contract, or they have no time on their contracts left at all. They're basically what you'd call a free agent in North American sports. The difference between the two types of transfers are the amount of time remaining on the player's contract and the transfer fee. Bosman transfers, or free transfers as they are also known, are only for players with just a few months remaining on their contracts 
and typically do not require a transfer fee. If the buying team does pay a fee, it's usually for very little money. As you can imagine, Bosman transfers are attractive to buying teams because they can save money on transfer fees and there doesn't have to be a lot of commitment to a Bosman transfer. If things work out, great. If they don't, then they didn't pay a whole lot of money for that player to begin with. Bosman transfers and football free agency have only just become available across football and it's thanks to Jean-Marc Bosman. Jean-Marc Bosman was an above average football player in Belgium in the 1980s and 1990s. When his contract with his Belgian professional club ended, he attempted to join a French professional club. The problem is his former Belgian club still technically owned his rights to play football. The Belgian club had to sell his rights to the French club in order for Bosman to be allowed to transfer to that French team. The Belgian club valued him far more highly than the French club did and asked for a high price in return for Bosman's transfer, but the French club said no. So Bosman was stuck with the Belgian club that also decided to cut his wages by 75%. So he sued the Belgian club in addition to UEFA and several other football organizations and took it to the European Court of Justice. In 1995, the court ruled in Bosman's favor, opening up free agency and allowing for the Bosman transfer to take place. The other type of transfer, which is the one that sparks the most rumors and the most drama, is the regular transfer. These regular transfers are the ones that command huge prices from the buying clubs and provide money for the selling clubs. The selling clubs use the money they get from a transfer and can use it to fund their own player acquisition or use it to finance the team's operation and staff payroll. The buying club gets to use the player's football skills to help win as many games as they can. These transfers are really tricky to negotiate because there are a lot of moving parts involved in these. The player's agent, the player, and the two different clubs need to be satisfied with the terms of the agreement in order to make a transfer happen and there are a lot of egos to balance during the contract negotiation process. A lot of egos to balance during the contract negotiation process. It's not like in North American sports, where players are shipped off without much consideration for their own opinion. Only no trade clauses can really prevent players from being traded from one team to another in North American sports, and even those can be waived. Now transfers, both Bosman and regular, are just some of the ways that players join different clubs. The other main ways are putting players on loan and signing them to the club's academy program when the players are younger. Now a loan is a way to send out young players who need more development and aren't getting enough playing time on the parent club. This usually entails more development beyond just playing in the academy. The parent club will usually contact a club in a league with lesser competition or more opportunities for the young player and the two agree to loan the player out to the new club. Loans are beneficial for both teams because the parent club gets to treat the other club like a minor league development program that helps the player get skills and get playing time they otherwise wouldn't have had on the parent club, and the new club gets to use this player to improve their own team for as long as that player is on loan. The parent club often pays for the loan player's salary, which is another win for the new club. They don't have to pay this player, and there's little obligation on their part towards the loan player. Some of the wealthiest clubs, like Manchester City and Chelsea, have agreements in place with lesser clubs that say that all loaned players must go to those clubs. Academies are schools and training grounds for football players. Professional clubs have their own academies that they recruit players to. At these academies, players are supposed to develop skills for professional football, as if they were baseball players in a minor league baseball system. The club then pays for their room, their board, their food, and their training while with the academy. It's a good way to control the development of each player while having them learn the same skills that you want every other player to learn. Now, once signed with an academy, though, the players are committing to several years with the parent club. Some players even sign up to 10-year contracts with their parent club. Now, this is how young players are eventually brought up to the big leagues. They develop, they get sent out on loan if need be, and if they're ready to play football with the big kids, the club brings them up to contribute. While clubs do spend a lot of funds on their academies and on a lot of players who likely will never become professional football players, it's more than worth it for the club because the players that do end up becoming superstars and play for the parent club generate so much revenue for them that it's all worth it. 